The Lord be with you. Let me remind you as you're turning to John chapter 4, I'll be reading verses 5 through 42, so I know that's a bit of a haul, but let me remind you it is also uh, allergy season out there, so uh, just because somebody coughs, don't like, <laughs> like sp- hose them down with Lysol or whatever, yeah, don't, I mean, pollen does make your throat blue, so I'm just saying, so. John chapter 4, we'll begin in verse 5, read through verse 42. So he came to a Samaritan city called Sakar, <clears throat> near this plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and, said to, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I am. The one is, who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman. But no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest. But I tell you, look around and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we ask for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, not mine, but words of distraction that may be on our hearts and in our minds this morning. 
We ask for eyes to see the way forward, hands open to receive, hearts open to love. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I want to do something uh, uh, this morning, a little mental exercise with you. First, I want you to close your eyes. This doesn't have anything to do with COVID-19, I promise. Close your eyes. Now, uh, I want you to imagine a person, just any person, but not just any person. I want you to imagine the kind of person you first think of when I say the word Christian. What kind of person do you see? If I had to guess, I'd say most of you probably see a man. Most of you women might see another woman. And that man or woman is most likely white because, well, you're most likely white. Probably middle-aged, probably wearing nice clothes, slacks and a button-down, a nice skirt maybe. And even though you can't necessarily see it, I'd venture a guess that the person you're envisioning is likely an English-speaking American. Now, without opening your eyes, I want you to imagine a different person. This time, I want you to imagine a girl, probably in her late teens or early 20s, with dark hair and dark skin. Her clothes are tattered, well-worn, and there aren't likely to be shoes on her feet. She doesn't have an email address. She's never had a cell phone. She can't drive a car. Probably doesn't even have a relative that owns a car. She likely can't read, and she definitely doesn't speak English. Chances are she's the kind of person whose face you'd only see in the international news or on some UNICEF ad, the kind of person who inhabits those parts of the world south of the equator. You got that person, don't open your eyes, you see her. That girl you're seeing now in your imagination, she is actually what most Christians look like in this world. According to David Livermore in his book, Serving with Eyes Wide Open, she represents a majority of Christians in the 21st century. Most of you will likely never meet anyone like her. But you can open your eyes now. All of us in this room are product of our environment, the ways we were raised, our 20, 21st century American, Southern, Evangelical, Christian environment. So it really isn't all that surprising that if somebody asks you to close your eyes and imagine what a typical Christian looks like, that you'd probably see somebody who looks a lot like you. In fact, I dare say that most people in this world, most people throughout history, when they imagine someone, regardless of the type of person they're trying to imagine, they most likely envision someone like themselves. For example, if a 15th century German was asked to imagine a baker, they'd probably imagine a 15th century German baker. Or let's say, let's say you were a 1st century Jew from maybe the region of the Galilee, one who followed Jesus around from the beginning and was asked to picture in your own mind what might a follower of Jesus look like. You can imagine what they would have Imagine, right? Chances are they would have pictured another man, a Jewish man with a pretty decent reputation, maybe even a curious Pharisee on the verge of conversion. Maybe the first century followers of Jesus, if they had been asked, what does another follower of Jesus look like? They would have imagined someone like we ran into last week, the nighttime visitor to Jesus, Nicodemus. He would have been a great candidate for a follower of Jesus, especially when you give the context of John's gospel. Nicodemus was a man, just like the 12 other most notable disciples of Jesus. He was Jewish, again, like those first disciples of Jesus. A Pharisee, like, frankly, most of Jesus' followers would have been. He was educated. He was a man of influence with his position on the Sanhedrin. And he had a good reputation. We know that because he came to Jesus, not in the middle of the day, didn't schedule an appointment, didn't bump into him on the street, but came to him in the cover of night, in the dark. Yes, Nicodemus would have surely been in the running for Jesus' next top disciple. He would have been the person. He fit a certain mold. But the writer of John's Gospel left us with Nicodemus last week still in the dark still covered in secret, still holding back from following Jesus and accepting the full truth of who he was. 
In this fourth gospel, we leave Nicodemus in the dark and we move on to our story this morning by a well in Samaria. Not at night, not in a secret place, but in the bright light of the noonday sun with a woman and a Samaritan woman at that. In chapter 4 of John's Gospel, we're told that Jesus had to go through Samaria, but that's not true. Samaria wasn't an ideal place for a band of Jews in the first century. Not necessarily because it was any more dangerous than any other part of Judea, but because it was the territory of the Samaritans. And Jews had a, a pretty circuitous route figured out to get around Samaria. No need to go through it. Might have been a little quicker, but no need to go through it. Jews in the first century despised everything about the Samaritans, saw them as half-breeds, a people whose history have had root, may have had roots in Jewish soil, but whose branches were tainted with the presence of Gentile and Babylonian blood. You see, the Samaritans of the first century were the descendants of those Israelites who occupied the northern territory that was the kingdom of Israel. And after the Assyrians conquered it in 722 B.C., some of them remained behind and intermarried with the Assyrians. And the offspring of all this intermarrying became the Samaritans. And since they were rejected by the Jews, since they weren't accepted by Gentiles, they founded their own central place of worship, grounded in their own understanding of the God of their shared ancestors. The Jewish exclusion of the Samaritans had led to the seclusion of the Samaritans from the Jews. But the gospel said Jesus had to go through Samaria, not because it was a more direct route to Galilee, but because there was something there, someone there, that Jesus had to show his disciples. Unlike the nocturnal story of chapter 3 with Nicodemus, we find Jesus tired out by his journey, sitting by this well. The NRSV says about noon, it's high noon the middle of the day, the time of day when the sun is straight overhead and there are no shadows to be found, no places to duck and hide. There's no darkness, no shadows. We're told in verse 7 that a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus is sitting by the well trying to take a break, and great, now a Samaritan woman, a half-breed, a woman no less in the first century, comes to the well. You see, Jewish men were taught not to speak to women in public, not even their own wives. But now a woman, a Samaritan woman, has come to draw water from this well where Jesus, a Jewish man who's taught not to speak to women, is sitting in the middle of the day in the open where they might be seen. And some people have made hay on the fact that like, well, you know, women don't go out in the middle of the day to draw water. And that's true. Why? It's hot. Nobody wants to go out. But someone who doesn't want to be recognized, somebody maybe who doesn't want to be ridiculed publicly, goes out, but you know, you know that doesn't make it a secret, right? You ever driven by the church in the middle of the week, and there's a car, and you go, who's that? Who, who's up at the church? Oh yeah, people aren't crowded around, but they all looking out the window at the house, look at that, look at that woman, who's that? Who's that? The disciples, we're told, have gone into the village to buy some food. So it's not like Jesus is there with other people. He's breaking the Billy Graham rule. You know that rule. A man's not supposed to be alone with another woman. Here's Jesus. Oh, no. The disciples have gone into town, and Jesus and this woman are alone, vulnerable to scandal, vulnerable to being seen interacting with a Samaritan woman in public. And she is vulnerable to being seen interacting with a Jewish man. You can imagine the tabloids around Galilee, right? Radical rabbi caught in the act of conversing with a seductive Samaritan. would be there. The culturally and socially correct thing for them to have done would have been to simply ignore each other. But for that woman to say, oh, there's a man, I'll come back later. And for Jesus to simply look the other way or say, well, I'll just take a stroll down the road and come back when she's gone. But Jesus, Jesus has a knack for ignoring what is socially acceptable. And so in verse 7, he starts this conversation with this woman that's not too unlike the conversation he had just a few verses before with Nicodemus. He asks for a drink from the well. The first thing the woman says to him 
says, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? She gets it. She knows the rules. She knows what's acceptable. But Jesus, Jesus being Jesus, gets to the point of his sacred encounter and begins to tell her about this true gift of God, the source of living water. And like Nicodemus before her, she's a bit confused by Jesus' weaving of eternal truth with temporal metaphor. How can one be born again? Can a man go back into his mother's womb? What do you mean living water will always quench my thirst? So Jesus tells her in verse 16, go call your husband and come back. Not because he thinks the husband can clarify. Men, don't use this. Don't, don't say Jesus said, go get your husband and come back. No. Jesus, Jesus is pricking the conversation, knowing there's something deeper with this woman. Finally, it appears as if he's getting with the program of social proper mores. I can't talk to you. Go get your husband, and then we'll talk. Except for one thing. Well, maybe five things. The woman tells Jesus, I have no husband. A statement alone for an adult woman living in Samaria in the first century, that is tragic. But what's more is Jesus says, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands. And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Now I want to pause right here for a minute and salvage this woman's reputation. Uh, You've likely heard something to the effect that This woman, having been married five times, is somehow an indication of her poor life choices, her poor choice in men, her immoral living. But to think in such a way is to see her through the lens of our own time and context, our understanding, a time when divorce, frankly, is an entirely different thing. In the first century, a woman had no more control over her marital status than she did whether the sun came up or went down. A woman could not divorce a man, literally could not divorce a man. And likely this woman was either put out by the men she had been married to, an action Jesus himself condemns on behalf of the man, or, perhaps more tragically, she was a widow several times over. If she was an adulteress, then it would have been unlikely that she would have ever been remarried. Either way, her life would have been one of pain, grief, and embarrassment. Imagine if she was a widow five times over. You can imagine that. Don't marry her. She'll wind up dead. Don't marry her. Jesus tells this woman something about her that no stranger, especially a Jewish man, could know. And in her amazement, she continues her conversation with Jesus, calls him a prophet. And Jesus goes on to tell her that God is not a God who separates the Jews from the Samaritans or any other nation from another. In fact, Jesus says, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God's not defined by where you keep him. Whether it's Samaria, whether it's Jerusalem. God's not defined by how you think of him. By your people, by your nation, by your language, by your gender, by anything else. God's not defined that way, Jesus said. And if God's not defined that way, God's people aren't defined that way. God's people will not be defined by their gender, their race, their social location, their national identity, or any other human-made label, Jesus said. So when this woman says... I know that Messiah is coming and John has to clean it up for his non-Jewish audience. That's the Christ, folks. When he comes, he will proclaim all these things to us. And in his response, Jesus gives the first of the ego a me sayings in the fourth gospel. The I am sayings. I am the one who is speaking to you. The word he is not there in the Greek. We put it to make the sentence flow better, but it's not there. The disciples show up about this time, and they're shocked. Why, why is he talking to a woman? Doesn't Jesus know? Didn't Mary raise him right? Why is Jesus talking to a woman? But they don't say anything. They're too apprehensive to question Jesus about this woman's presence. And she's so overcome by what she's heard. It's passing there. You almost miss it. 
Why did she come? She came to draw water. She needs it to wash the dishes, to cook, to clean, to live. Why does she leave it, though? She doesn't need that water anymore. She leaves her water jar, the very thing that brought her to the well in the first place, to go and tell others what she has just experienced. And in many ways, this Samaritan woman becomes the very first evangelist. Meanwhile, Jesus has this exchange with his disciples, as he so often does in the fourth gospel, that that makes him sound like he's just staring off into the middle distance and floating around as he talks. But it's not too long, not too long before Jesus has this in this conversation with this woman, it's one that mirrors something he may have said. He says, many Samaritans from the city, the scripture says, many Samaritans from that city believed because of this woman's testimony. And the gospel tells us that Jesus stayed there two days and many more believed because of his word. Now later on they say, we don't believe because of what you said, we heard him now. But come on. That's just a way of putting a woman back behind another man. They believed first because they heard her. They many more believed. This woman's words, her testimony, brought others to hear Jesus' words, and because of her words, they came to believe. But no one, not a single soul among Jesus' followers in that day would have pictured this woman, a Samaritan woman, this five-time divorced, shacking up with her brother of her latest late husband, woman, would it be an evangelist, a proclaimer of the good news of the arrival of the Christ? But all around us, all around us in our community, in our workplaces, across our state, across our nation, across the world, there are people who we would never imagine to be bearers of the gospel. Whether it's their age, their long hair, their shaved scalps, their dark skin, their tattered clothes, their tattoos, their tailored suits, their native languages, their, their political affiliations, their nationality, their, their relationships, their physical abilities, their physical disabilities, their intelligence or their lack of intelligence, their ignorance, their piercings, whatever it may be, we see them and go, there's no way they could be a sharer, a bearer of the gospel. We may tend to take one look at them and dismiss them and say, well, actually, they're one who needs to hear the gospel. We may see those who are unlike us, or better yet, those we don't like, as those who need the gospel, those whose lives need to be changed by the gospel as we see it. But friends, I'm here to tell you, they might just be the people to change us. They might just be our sisters and brothers in Christ already. And what's worse, and I hate to think about this, but I know it's true, is that there are those people with whom Christians refuse to share the gospel. They see them as too dirty, too vile, too far gone. They judge them based on a system of rules and doctrines that they hold to be true. And yet these folks have never heard the whole story. We see them as the Jews of the first century saw those Samaritans. Just go around them. You don't have to go through them. Just go around them. Don't talk to them. You know what their ancestors did? Just go around them. Second-class citizens, better off kept in their own little place, better off kept in the margins, out of sight. We prefer to ghettoize them, to draw boundaries around them, label them as a lost cause. Friends, this is not, this is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has no lost cause. So if we're to learn anything from this Samaritan woman's story, from this conversation with Jesus, let it be this, that God is not a God who draws lines. God is not a God who brings, or God is a God, rather, who brings people together through the saving grace of Christ Jesus. And God calls his people to be that kind of people. The kind who don't draw lines, but the kind of people who seek to bring others together. To bring others into our lives with the gospel. God is calling us, like Jesus, to take risks. Risk to be scandalized, risk to be talked about, risk to be seen as, oh, you know those people. To step outside of our comfort zones. To live and love those people whom we'd rather just ignore. We'd rather just go around than pass by. To say to everyone's definitive statements about others, well, actually, I don't believe that's how God sees them at all. 
I pray that we be those people. That we see the gospel in others. To recognize at times that those people who we think need the gospel the most may be the very ones who need to share it with us. We strive to take risks, to step outside of our comfort zones, to love those we'd rather ignore. After all, isn't that what God's done for us? I sometimes wonder if, from the cosmic perspective, if God wouldn't have just said, you know what, let's just go around Earth, start over at Mars. Let's just go around it. But he doesn't. God risked the life of Christ in order to show God's love for us. A love that is universal. A love that is for all of those who choose to accept it. No matter who they are. No matter what they are. No matter at all. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we come now to this time where we listen to you speak to our hearts, we pray, Lord, that you stir among us, that your Holy Spirit speaks to us, and Lord, that you move and call us to move as well. Speak to our hearts now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.